place now to make fun of all the nations by doing their impossible motions. <laughs> but we think that this isn't actually as impossible as it sounds, Because we think that the concept of state borders not only confines individuals to a certain piece of land, we also think that it is the source of many grievances because the fact that state borders are far more coercive, have a much larger authority than other drawn borders, ladies and gentlemen. We think on our side of the house, the problem of state and national interest is causing unnecessary grievances, and that's why we should abolish the entire concept of the nation state. What are we going to prove to you on our side of the house? We're going to prove to you firstly, what borders have done, specifically and uniquely in the context of the 21st and 20th centuries, why they are they cause unnecessary conflicts, why it ties people to loyalty that they shouldn't and necessarily need to possess. Secondly, we're going to talk to you about how liberating people from the very concept of the nation state leads to a much more harmonious society in which people don't argue about whether they are American or British and also whether they are better because they are British or American, but because they are part of a larger whole, no thank you, as members of planet Earth. What are we going to do for you in the first uh, minister? Firstly, we're going to define our model. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to abolish the concept of the nation state. We are going to introduce a federalized Earth government, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to be based on the United Nations in the status quo because that's the closest thing to have. We're gradually going to phase that out in, some, in favor of something like the European Parliament, in which everybody is elected on a grand scale. We are also going to let states remain, ladies and gentlemen, as regional governments with far less authority and no longer enforceable uh, by the fact of something like passports and other things like borders, uh, like jurisdiction and so forth. Why do we think this is a far more beneficial universe than the one we are currently living in? Well, let's explain what the current universe looks like. No thank you. We say on our side of the house that fundamentally, no thank you, the concept of the nation state is a very recent development. It's only in the 19th century that France became what it actually was. And we think that for many years people have lived without the concept of borders. And people were also much happier as a result of that. Reason number one, because borders were not enforceable in times long past, ladies and gentlemen. We think that the fact that borders are enforceable in the concept of the nation state is the cause of unnecessary conflict. Because it creates security reasons, ladies and gentlemen. Because you feel a higher a prior sense of belonging to the idea of the nation state than to the idea of prime planet Earth. That's why, for example, Serbians in Serbia are worried about the existence of Bosnian Muslims, even though they don't really do anything except live there. Because we arbitrarily draw a line between these people, and because we somehow make them believe that this line is important, suddenly Serbians and Bosnians have to argue with each other and fight over limited resources in the name of national prestige, ladies and gentlemen. We think that this concept of the nation state arbitrarily contrib contributes to the creation of artificial security concepts, which are the cause of national grievances. Firstly, the idea of nation state versus nation state. Secondly, the idea of the majority minority problem. If you are a minority in a certain state, and if you feel a sense of, if you don't feel a sense of collection or belonging to that idea of the concept of the state, you are more likely to go and act for independence, ladies and gentlemen. Which is exactly what happened in Donetsk. Which is exactly what happened in Crimea, ladies and gentlemen. We think that these kind of things wouldn't happen if national state borders were not enforced and Crimeans could actually say, oh, I'm from Crimea, but I'm actually on um, planet Earth, and the Russians, they're, well, they're my best pass. Right? <laughs> <laughs> An easier concept to define. Next, we talk to you the idea of national prestige in terms of territorial disputes. Let's face it, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of the things that Japan is arguing about in the current paradigm is just a bunch of rocks that don't really have any monetary value at all. But the reason why we have to fight over these useless pieces of rocks that do not contribute in any way, shape, or form to the economy is because we believe that Japan has to be a great nation, and in order to have this great nation, we have to win the land dispute with China, and that's why, ladies and gentlemen, Japan is fighting over a group of rocks that have no meaning. Yes. Do you also believe that the 
relation by ethnicity or gender, that kind of identity should also be abolished under your paradigm. Well, do we think that the problem is that these things don't have enforceable borders in the current paradigm, right? You can be Christian anywhere in the world, and they're not enforceable. Therefore, as a collective says, you don't feel that you are being threatened. It's only when Christians and Muslims are put in a single state that they start to feel security concerns, ladies and gentlemen. And that's the idea that we want to propagate on our side of the house. We think that Christians and Muslims and other ethnicities on their own do not really feel a sense of being threatened. It's only when you give them enforceable borders, which are arbitrarily drawn, which do not necessarily, uh, which are not necessarily congruent with the very idea of religion and ethnicity, the things start to get out of hand. So why do we think that our paradigm is a better way to govern the world than the ones that we have imposed in the current situation? Well, Mr. Speaker, we say on our side of the house that the reason why everybody wants to fight over something, or everybody wants to fight each other, is precisely because of the idea of national interest and security security concept. We think that getting rid of that is going to help with the idea that maybe you're part of a larger whole, right? The reason why people from New Jersey and Florida don't fight over a bit of land like Disneyland is precisely because they feel that this land is in America at the end of the day. We think that this is going to happen on a much larger scale when you think that this, like, this Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem not only belongs to the Israelis, it also belongs to the Muslims in the sense that you're all part of a larger whole as global citizens of planet Earth. We think that it gets rid of security concerns because borders are no longer enforceable and that means, Mr. Speaker, there is better movement of people, meaning that you have more access to the kind of resources that people fight over in the current paradigm, Mr. Speaker. We think that that's another reason that state borders are bad, is because they allow a monopoly of certain resources over arbitrarily drawn enforceable juris jurisdictions. What have we told you on side proposition? We told you, firstly, that we think that the idea idea of the state is what is actually causing most of our grievances in the current paradigm. It's because we allow, we force groups of identities into a single arbitrarily drawn concept. Secondly, we told you that you can actually prop an impossible motion. We're very proud of it. We're going to call upon Rita, our opposition, to to our slide. Firstly, I'm going to look at two things. So firstly, I'm going to look at the harm of what is going to happen when we abolish borders on two people. Firstly, 
Firstly, what I'm going to look at the domestic citizens, and secondly, I'm going to look at the idea of the influence. And secondly, what we see in the status quo, what we see in this control of the border, is going to be absolutely beneficial for the state, uh, and also in the citizens, but also for the immigrants who come into the state. But lastly, how many is important to prioritize the people within the nation state who is the citizens over the immigrants who might actually want to come because they're going to the first of three reasons. Um, Okay, that's exactly the point, right? You talked about how citizens choose, but we think it's a problem of the method. Because minorities will always be voted out, and they can never gain independence if the citizens choose. That's why you have to get rid of these borders, so you don't have to worry about the whole concept. Firstly, okay, I'm going to introduce our reputation into my reputation because I'm going to do it, right? So before that, let's look at the reputation that I'm going to do. So firstly, it's going by the model that governments have given us, right? So they told us they're going to create this like environment cosmopolitan utopia, say the whole thing. Like, <laughs> like an arbitrary border that exists, but they, they are the ones who told us the borders still exist, right? Then what we have to recognize this day today, there are two problems. Firstly, all the harm that Nixon provided in today's space, saying that there is a problem, for example, like a Serbian Bosnia fighting each other country, or for example, the men having a national pride in those places, does not actually change any of their paradigms, right? Why? We have to realize that when actually, for example, states, like for example, Japan or China still exist in their paradigm, we have to realize that those people are still actually going to have the national pride. Because even if the border becomes a bit arbitrary and the power weakens, still there is a language, still there is a culture that is actually going to be dominated within the country, and those people feel that I am just that different from those Chinese, and therefore that is how even in the paradigm people are still going to have pride that I am different from them. I want those like a talk that does not have any big economic benefit, but that is because I'm Japanese, right? We don't see the benefit or the harm of this like a pride that comes on does not change this debate, it does it down. Also, in the case of like for example, like Serbians and Bosnians, we have to realize that still this idea of the Soviets and Bosnians exists in the places. They speak a different language, they have the different national flag, and then those people are still going to feel the identity from that is something different from the borders, right? They're still going to feel the identity that I am different from those Bosnians, and therefore I'm going to have to fight. And maybe those conflicts and time I've given to you, we think that is also going to happen in their power. That is not mutually exclusive in today's day. Lastly, so she told us, look. Right, for example, we are going to look at the definition. She told us the United Nations are going to right, be right, empowered to control everything. Firstly, we think there was pretty much a lack of a moral high school behind the state, but we think there is also a clear problem. Uh, I'm sorry, I just want to be okay. So, <laughs> and we have to say that there is going to be a pretty much unjust harm, especially to those countries who are having a weak position. We have to realize that the United Nations this might not be, for example, like a pretty much fair organization, which is more likely that the big country, like for example Japan, United States, all the rough countries, are likely to have a power and authority to control how to organize the United Nations, control over them, right, not sit down. Which means, even instead of still going to argue that we are going to make this problem more than Utopia, but still we leave to go to the state of the idea of the state, which means those big countries are likely to enforce the power to make that in favor, in, right, all this rule and system that is going to be in favor of them, we think that is going to be a harm, like for example the African country, that is still going to exist in their power. So, given that, let's look at two things. Why we think that, firstly, the domestic citizens are likely to be harmed first? We think the domestic citizens, as an assertion, is going to be obviously harmed by this policy for two reasons. Firstly, for example, most people are more likely to actually lose a job because more like because we have to assume that, especially when we talk about the developed countries, those immigrants from the developing countries are likely to massively immigrate to those countries. And those, for example, if there are more high ability people than the natural citizens, those people are likely to lose a job. But secondly, even if those people have a job, for example, those people are going to receive compactly back to your best salary. Why? Because we have to realize that when these number of immigrants come into those places, which means governments are more likely to be to minimize the service, because these companies are actually going to believe that, look, even if we offer this amount of salary to the people, and then we are actually offering now, there will be more citizens, for example, which is for immigrants, who are actually going to receive our job with the less salary than we're paying for now. And those companies are more likely to have an incentive to lower the salary to which be paid, but otherwise going to tell the citizens that if we're not going to accept a less salary, I'm going to fire or I'm going to hire this immigrant, right? We think those citizens are likely to receive a massive harm. For example, in job places, we think that is harmful. Not sit down. Second, let's look at the idea of the immigrants. Maybe they're going to assume that immigrants are going to be pretty much far better off by the policy, but we think that is rubbish for a couple of reasons. Firstly, we'll think those immigrants are likely to receive less benefit because by the influx of these immigrants, for example, that is actually going to make our all these like right wing people, right wing party be motivated to actually restrict the right of those immigrants are going to have, prioritize all the citizens living inside the country. 
most men, for example, right wing party are more likely to restrict the rights that, for example, immigrants have. Like, for example, they're going to cut all this welfare that immigrants receive. They're going to actually cut off all the wages. For example, they're not going to actually assure a fundamental right to those people. Not like an absolute one, for example, which is something very important for the citizens' right, which can be preserved by the citizens. Second, it's more likely to think that conflicts are more likely to occur between the immigrants and the citizens, like if this is happening, for example, in a Europe country, where, for example, all these European countries are actually going to fight back against the Muslims who are coming inside for taking away their job. As I have told in the first point, when citizens believe that they are receiving harm by the influx of the immigrants, those immigrants are likely to be attacked to citizens, and those people are more likely to attack back against those Europeans who attack those back, back to the Europeans and going to receive massive harm by <coughs> We have to realize that there will be a conflict. Also, we see the places of the ghettos. Oh, sorry, I'm not going to have time for this. I, don't, I think my partner's going to talk about it. So we see there will be a harm. <laughs> <laughs> given that, even if we concede there is actually the benefit to immigrants to an extent, while we have to prioritize all the citizens, we have to realize that citizens are the ones who should be the part of the national sovereignty, who actually make it all this obligation and therefore should be obliged to actually receive a benefit from the state. They are the ones who should be keeping the integrity of the nation state. That is a principle we're going to stand by saying the same people as a citizen should receive more benefit than any of that. We got a call from the Deputy Prime Minister. Don't worry, you're not going. Ladies and gentlemen, the fundamental problem we are saying is whether 
it has to be coercive or something blocking uh, those kind of those kind of mechanisms is necessary or not. For example, even the case of the, the United States and the Texas man has its own identity, although they, it, ha it just has their open administrative framework. So, ladies and gentlemen, those kind of coercive framework and the definition of the culture or the race is not something truly relevant in the first place. No. <laughs> of the car side as a vision in the first place. So, the back to the issue about the, and it leads to the marvelous first argument about the issue of national pride for the ethnic group. <coughs> so, the only argumentations coming from the opposition side is predicated on the existence of the nation state. That because we can do this, and this is the benefit because we have the nation state. But ladies and gentlemen, they are fundamentally negligent to the speech towards the prime minister because we already the, we, uh, the what we're saying today is that we dilute the fundamental definition of the nation state and creating a new framework to govern the, uh, on the entire earth. So, ladies and gentlemen, those kind of the definition of the benefit should actually change by taking by introducing a new metric, new administrative framework, and in the first place. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, we don't call the benefit and in the first place. And it's, it's impossible for us to compare the, the benefit of the nation state and created uh, the, uh, uh, how I call it, the, the creation of the benefit by taking our proposal. So we use the metric of the, those kind of, the, how I call it, the benefit towards the people on the ground and which is beneficial to have the national nation state or not. So, ladies and gentlemen, today's, uh, today's proposition, uh, today's opposition is also that. Uh, by taking this proposal, an ethnic community won't be achieved, and that's quite uh, that's significant harm to the entire nation, like the case of Muslim in France, or like uh, the uh, how I call it, and like uh, the problem between North and South Sudan, or etc. etc. But ladies and gentlemen, a as I already told you, and those kind of, uh, we still hold the idea of the state and or the idea of this, uh, the race, uh, race or the language, and which is something related to the land they have. So, ladies and gentlemen, that they can, uh, if the if the person who loves the culture or the race can go into the region, and if the person don't like it, and we can go out. So it's kind of the open and free movement mechanism. The, uh, open free movement mechanism will give the optimal benefit to the people on the ground because it's, uh, it lowers the bar to achieve the, what they want to be or the, what they want uh, what they want to be in one. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, the, those kind of the, the, those kind of the benefit on the individual level won't be achieved according to the nation according to the concept of nation state precisely because it's not easy for them to actually go into uh, go into the what they want uh, where they want to be in or go out from what they want go be in. So ladies and gentlemen, in terms of the individual mobility and the, uh, the possibility to actualize themselves, we think that our proposal is completely better. And even if, ladies and gentlemen, they say that those kind of national states create a certain definition of the race or the gender, but it, it has to be compatible, ladies and gentlemen. So, especially in African nations, and there's a pair uh, those I call it. The difference between the distinct uh, the border and distinct uh, those kind of the area of the ethnicity is actually hugely different in the status quo. And that's the one of the cause of the racial uh, racial conflict, the uh, ethnic conflict, as the Prime Minister told you. But ladies and gentlemen, by dissolving those kind of the framework, then we can achieve the efficient allocation of the race according to the race or the gender or what the mother, what the opposition side want to achieve. So ladies and gentlemen, in terms so even in terms of the race or the gender or the other identity, we think we should take our proposal. Lastly, the issue of the immigrants, well, is, and, and by the, because of the huge influx of the immigrants and those kind of the unfair allocation of the salary, will happen, etc., etc. Ladies and gentlemen, it's too unrealistic in the first place. Precisely because they're looking at the globalization society, the idea of free loss is gradually prevailing, and they actually they put the importance of the individual value, not of those kind of the uh, issue of the land or etc., etc. Moreover, we think it's quite discriminatory to uh, to set the value according to the land because the fundamental Fundamental nature or the value of the people is fundamentally the same. For all those reasons, ladies and gentlemen, nation state is something absolutely bad. We got a crowd of dead later on opposition, Mitsushi Ono.
it doesn't automatically mean that every different concept should be somewhat magically neutralized and abolished. Because as the leader, deputy leader of the deputy prime can said, there will be some another metrics with which people differentiate identity and people under their product, right? So we shouldn't turn our blind eyes to the real differences. We should deal with those differences. That's how we should overcome the any problems that they have been talking about in this slide. I'm going to examine uh, several issues here. First of all, let's examine the real problems that they have been talking about. The, the grievances the Prime Minister described are really intrinsically inherent to the concept of nation state, and that's the huge dispute in the debate. Second, secondly, as my partner, as my partner referred, I will examine some of the like, a crazy principle. Like, whether people inside have an autonomous own right to decide who to let in or who to let go. Finally, uh, thirdly, I'm going to talk about the, like, the actual benefit of like a benefit or harm of open framework mechanisms that the deputy prime minister mentioned. If I have if I have time, I will mention about the impact of the minority because that was implicated, implied in the point of inflation coming from this time. So first of all, the, the grievances that they have been talking about, like all the arguments are about the problem of warfare and problem about the concrete, not necessarily about the concept of a nation state. Notice this, speaker, ladies and gentlemen. Under their cosmopolitan world, that sort of potential discussion is supposed to exist. Like, I live in this place, you are not. I live in this city, you are not. This sort of geographical differences are also associated with this sort of conflicts even under their problem, right? It's totally infeasible idea to cope with all conflicts coming from any discrepancy. The solution is to deal with these differences. That's why we have free trade agreement among countries. That's why we have regional organization. That's why we have international jurisprudence, which enable ICC or ICJ to prosecute or deal with international or transnational conflicts, right? But their proposal will like disincentivize the international community to organize the political institutions to deal with these actual problems case by case. And that's the genuine harm of it. Like a turning blind eyes to the real reality. No, thank you. Second of all, I will maybe I change the order. Let me directly look at and then what Deputy Prime Minister have said. I will take it later, sorry. I will surely take it later. The benefit <laughs> from the other side is the me a mechanism of open make it open framework for legal reasons. But notice the immigrants, because of the isometricality of information or disparity of information, oftentimes these people are marginalized or exploited in the country. And that's why in the United States of America, in military uh, military personnel or mercenary, the most of the, the, the workers who engage in dangerous activities are oftentimes the immigrant or blue population coming from Latin America or Mexican people like that. We don't think that this that sort of open frame mechanism, mechanism will like consequentially benefit the immigrants as a whole. We, we, we don't think these people have, have, have sufficient capability to use, use their own languages to like get the best information to find a job. But rather, this sort of bottom one bottom effects unnecessarily or disproportionately pressurize these uh, poor people to go outside for no better reasons, and that's a real problem of the other side. Okay. Moving on to so-called principle, I don't know whether this is argument in the first place. But we claim on this side of the house is that people inside the territorial boundary should they have an autonomous or sovereign right to decide whom to let in or whom to kick out. Uh, for example, the similar we have similar conceptual framework in any other institution, like a companies or debate club or religious institution. If you want to join KDS, you mustn't have discriminatory thought. If you want to like opt to in Catholic church, maybe gay and lesbian people are not eligible, for example. If you want to work at Pony Canyon or Ibex, you have to <laughs> any other criterion or institution or boundary to select people. Because these criteria <coughs> represent or in, uh, reflect the view of the people inside the boundary. Because state is democratically elected by these people, state has a more a more imperative to respect the will of the people. There are several reasons, micro reasons why. First of all, oftentimes the resources inside the board, inside the territories are limited, just like the natural resources or political resources or financial resources are limited. And that's why that should be efficiently allocated or shared by the people. We cannot provide infinite number of resources for random number of people coming from the outside. And that's why this sort of some sort of core cohesive boundary or framework is necessary. Yeah. No, thank you. Second of all, it's necessary to have shared common background, common cultural values. For example, the right to vote or suffrage is given to individuals on the premise that individuals are capable of considering the interests of other members of society. And that's why children or prisoners or poor are not a like, granted right to vote. Because these people are not recognized as legitimate entity in poor society to recognize or consider the interests of the other people. In exactly in, in this particular reason, the border or cohesiveness of territory is necessary to defend the like, uh, integrity of the nation.
based on state, on the basis of the constitution. I will take it now. Okay, so you talked about how the problem is people discriminate. And your solution to that problem is ICJs, FDAs, and universal jurisdiction. That's a movement towards integration or getting rid of borders. Aren't you supporting our entire concept? I uh, know. What well, we have, uh, what well, we have emphasized on this side of the task is we are not like having a complete separated border, but we need to have selective approaches to uh, decide what kind of people we should cooperate with and what kind of people we can cut. This sort of selectiveness is a principle that we are supporting on this side of the task, which is consistent with the counter proposal or counter solution that we have proposed in this fight. Because their solution is like we shouldn't select anyone on any basis. That's the total yeah, rubbish. Yeah. That's what we propose on this side. No, thank you. I don't know what to talk about, so let's refer to the minority issues and need some for it out. I think that's a very good point. I don't know why the deputy is such a challenging point. <laughs> 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 Of, uh, the concept of nation state unduly marginalize the minority, or ethnic minority. But several respons responses here. In the context of liberal democracy, we have a super court that have capability to exercise judicial review, to examine the constitutionality of domestic law, to that extent that minorities, like uh, in case of the uh, Roe v. Wade, an abortion incident, or uh, a Brown vs. Nandoga incident, <laughs> yeah, that's true, yeah. <laughs> Let's open 
fascinating that Mrs. Speaker, the conclusion of the first class is immensely straightforward. The conclusion is that Mr. Speaker, national identity is special. Precisely because you are highly less likely to change your own national security and do in the particular context of African nation, Mr. Speaker, those borders itself is decided by the Western state in the first place. That is why, Mr. Speaker, we believe national identity itself is particularly harmful to be yeah. no no challenge at all from that side of the house. Recognizing that on the second issue, main issue of benefit and harm. The first idea we got from that side of the house is Look, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there is criteria to represent the views of people. So the right is to be the benefit to be, to be provided is not mutually exclusive. First and foremost, Mr. Speaker, this is not the case, Mr. Speaker. Precisely because, Mr. Speaker, as I clarify, in Africa, people are forced to represent their own will based on the arbitrary collective group in the past. And that's the problem we have to dispute like that, Mr. Speaker. And secondly, Mr. Speaker, let's be compatible under the paradigm of our debate, Mr. Speaker. Under the paradigm of our debate, based on their own real world, based on their own real identity, based on their own real identity, they can move from freedom, from freedom to be. Oh, 
because that side out is going to get up those kinds of movements in spite of the liberal army of those kinds of people, like for example, Islamic people, or like for example, Christian people. And that's the problem in the past, that's what's so wrong with that. How do they mention there is a disparity between the wealth and the power? First of all, yeah, there is that status quo. In the rhetoric of the UN, there is a hegemonic power in the USA and China, and so therefore, even as it is, that's not a mutual exclusive. And secondly, we are more likely to neutralize past rotary in the individual level. This is, this is people are allowed to do things based on their own view of Mr. Speaker. They own Mr. Speaker, the benefit of the how is very poor. People can move and work for the state and pay taxation and die for die for their own life. Die. die. <laughs> <laughs> that's a unique and specific benefit we are going to achieve. That's part of the Which we see in the status quo, which is France, right? 
So because we cannot erase the distinction between race and religion and only destroy the borders, which was actually protecting the line between these two societies, we fundamentally should oppose this motion. And that's why their point does not stand. And look, they're not able to okay. <laughs> okay, so it's difficult to say that the uh, national border is successfully working to define race or religion, looking at cases of Southeast Asia, Africa, or even China. So how can you say your prerequisites to say your benefit is working? Right, so the good example they brought to you is Africa. They told you that European nations have drawn the line artificially. And that's why now many races are becoming independent from other nations. If the line itself is not there, we can rewrite the line. It doesn't mean, sit down, it doesn't mean we should destroy all the lines. And that's the clear response to their side of the house. Next, we're moving on to the substantives. My partner has brought to you that this is going to create a massive harm to both citizens to the original nation and also to the immigrant. No, thank you. And they told you that, well, our analysis is imaginary. I study economics. Well, I'm the only Shakaijin in this round, and I wouldn't do a lecture on economy uh, from a student. <laughs> <laughs> right, so Yonara comes up and tells you, well, it's unrealistic. And it will happen because people will be uh, uh, judged based on individual value. Well, unfortunately, this is a typical bad rebuttal where I should give a, uh, give a lecture to him. Well, this is fundamentally not true, especially when simple labor is rushing into advanced nations like Europe or the United States, because when people are valued by individual value, and many people are not being able to add many value on certain jobs, it means that the race to the bottom will happen, with i.e. So the people from poor nations will rush in to the rich na richer nations and they will steal jobs from each other, which is the exact harm, uh, exact harm what, which was portrayed by our side of the house. Secondly, say, well, because economic co competition will happen and it will actually, the companies are eager to uh, raise the wage. This is also not true because this only happens under the status quo when companies relatively still have the national identity, such as Toyota, where they are determined to protect 3 million uh, jobs in Japan. If we take that away, simply, we don't, the companies will have the incentive to uh, hire people who accept less pay. And that's why we don't think their rebuttal stands. And since, um, since, they haven't really have made a valid engagement to the farms of immigrants. We believe that the, as the status quo is happening, we think extreme right-wing parties will attack, start attacking people, and it will only cause social discourse. Because we drastically increase the movement of people without any justification and any proof so that it works correctly, we think it's not just only justifiable, but harmful in practice. We shouldn't take this proposal. Thank you very much. I got, we got a pair uh, oh, of We got a pair of opposition reaper speaker. It's Shiona. Anything could cause conflict. 
But first of all, that's not mutually exclusive at all. Because under the cosmopolitan paradigm, as the deputy prime minister uh, explicitly stated, people will use uh, invoke another metric to differentiate identity on the basis of maybe geographical unity or racial The second report is yes, you can see the conflagration of conflict happen. But if that, that's the problem, then we should deal with it rather than ignoring reality and turning a blind, blind eyes to the reality. That's why we have FDA or regional cooperation or jurisprudential mechanisms. That their propose, their response is like those uh, alternative mechanisms are uh, consistent with their proposal, uh, their principle of uh, having no border. No, Mr. Speaker, because that sort of alternative mechanism are consistent with our proposal of uh, our principle of selective, uh, selective process of uh, having uh, people from the outside. Thereby, the con having conflict is not a reason to justify abolition of the border entirely. The second concession is individuals should be able to go anywhere that they really want to be. Yes, we can see that's possible under our paradigm too. I want to live in Hawaii. I can live in Hawaii under our paradigm. But I, I don't think that sort of a little bit difficulty can legitimize entire abolition of the nation state. Number three, post concession. The view of individual is particularly important in the, in the age of liberalization described by the big speaker. Yes, we of individuals are important. But the baby of the other side is they, really, they just care those who want to go and who want to come. They ignore the utility of those who don't want others to come from the other side. And that's the baby of the other side. Why is it fair to ignore the utility of these types of people? And that's what we have been defending in this debate. What do we mean by saying that? It's basically unfair to ignore the will of the people within the territory as they have their own values that, should, that are shared uh, historically. That's why we have tests for citizenship. That's why we consider criminal records or financial capability of immigrants. These sort of selectiveness criteria are fairly representing the interests and will of the people. And it's because the state is democratically elected by people, they should have reciprocal obligation to comply with the domestic values that these people have. We didn't see any clear engagement or the critical regard from the other side. Maybe Deputy uh, Supreme Minister replies we could do that, and that's too late. I know he will surely do that, but that's great. Sorry. <laughs> Finally, because I have nothing to say more, I would like to talk about something. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many friends in Kyrgyzstan. Under their part, maybe I will go to Kyrgyzstan and exploit my friends, like, like uh, having my own uh, entrepreneurial companies. That's possible under their part. Like, the a person like me only benefits. What about the minorities? What about the marginalized groups who don't have any information about uh, what the society will look like when they go to other countries? These people are further marginalized under their product. We think that's uh, so repugnant. We're happy to thank you. Thank you. We have one government replay speaker, Kowa Nikola. Enforceable borders have done by the 
engaging in some of the things that we talked about. So they say, they talked about immigrants, right? So they say, okay, immigrants are going to come in and rush and take our jobs. Number one, if somebody with no connections and a language barrier takes your job, maybe you have a problem. Number two, you can become an immigrant yourself. We don't see why that's potentially a bad thing, because they never really talked about the importance of having a job in your country of origin. You can get a job somewhere else. If you can't get a job in the United States, you can go to Burkina Faso and work as a cocoa farmer. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Two, they talked about how, like, Open Wish and Wit talked about how you can redraw borders. Yeah, that's a great idea. That's what the Ukrainians tried to do in Crimea. That's what the Chechnyans have been doing for ages in Russia. Let's try and redraw our borders. Let's kill innocent people. Let's die for an arbitrarily drawn cause that we feel no affinity to, that we don't belong to. Splendid idea, ladies and gentlemen. No. Three, let's look at the solution to the problem. Because they never really told you why the nation state is good. They just said, look, our idea is bad. We can solve the problems that are inherent in the nation state. We can integrate. We can have FDAs. We can have ICJ, which are things towards integration, which are all about getting rid of borders. They've just admitted that you can't do anything about borders. And the only thing you can do with them is not redraw them or rewrite them, but to get rid of them altogether. So we're not, uh, we're not conflicted or confined over the entire idea, ladies and gentlemen. Then they said, look, I watched Gundam. Yeah, I do. I'm not ashamed to admit it. But if you look at Gundam, you realize that the Earth Federation <coughs> forces did pretty well. <laughs> because they didn't care if they were from Australia. They didn't care if they were from like America. They just wanted to beat the crap out of the people who were up in the sky. They were able to unite for a common cause. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe Earth can be a single planet. So why do we think that, though, Mr. Speaker? Well, we think the opposition is determined to try and find things which are different, to try and discriminate people for differences, ladies and gentlemen. Right? They're trying to divide up the human race into blacks and Christians and Muslims and so forth. Right? If you do something like that, conflict is never going to end. So maybe, just maybe, it might be time to try and find things which are the same right? about each other. Like, you know, friendship. Right? We think that that's what you should do. You don't look for differences because that leads to conflict. You certainly don't try and enforce those differences because that also leads to conflict. Maybe, just maybe, it's time to try and start finding things which are the same, ladies and gentlemen. We think so, and we hope you do as well. Ooh.